So you can imagine how validating it was to finally hear of and read Dr. Bakhtiar's work and her ability um, through her work and her research to be able to arrive at a translation of the Quran which finally, for me, really captured the essence of Islam and is so beautifully aligned with the work that we're doing here tonight that we're supporting here for Turning Point. I want to sincerely thank you on behalf of everyone here for being here and joining us from Chicago just to come for the evening. And also, I want to also thank Dr. Mahdiar and make you all aware that copies of the Sublime Quran are on sale also at the back in the area with our silent auction. They are not signed copies, but there are some that have signed bookmarks from Dr. Bakhtiar. So please, again, just be aware that 40% of the proceeds have been graciously and generously donated for also in the name and the sake of our cause this evening. So please, I can personally vouch for this copy. It's very, very dear to me. I was one of the first to jump on Amazon and pre-order it. I really urge you to take a look at it. Tonight, like I said, 40% of the proceeds are being donated. So thank you so much. Please joining me, join me in welcoming Dr. Lele Bakhtia. the compassion. As we gather in this beautiful building, restored to its original self, we recall the abused women and children, victims of domestic violence. Just as this building was restored to its original beauty, so the work of Turning Point is to help the victims of domestic violence return through a greater struggle to their original, God-given, beautiful nature, torn for so ruthlessly and unjustly from them. It is not an easy task. That is why it is called the greater struggle. For most victims, it would not be possible to undertake this struggle back to their original self without the help of a group of devoted believers working through Turning Point to help them to develop into spiritual warriors, manifestations of spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare has been defined as granting mastery over the negative traits within the self in order to allow for the appearance of the light of the original nature to, uh, to appear. All positive traits become manifest within the self and all negative ones disappear. Abused by the animal self or nafsa amwari of another, the victims of domestic violence are encouraged by turning point to persevere in trying to regain their lost self, lost through no fault of their own, until firmness becomes their second nature. Then all kinds of temperance and courage become firmly rooted in them. All the varieties of wisdom and justice become manifest in them in actuality. The positive traits or virtues of temperance, courage, wisdom, and justice are the fruits of divine grace. They lie as potentials within human beings at the time of the infusion of the divine spirit. In this sense, they are gifts of God to be actualized by human beings in their struggle and striving against, egotistic, against the ego idol within in order to become worthy of the gifts. We believe that the greatest gift, that of the Quran, consistent and free from contradiction, is a message that was spread over 22 years and five months to the Prophet, who became a model for our understanding of the Quran, particularly during the blessed month of Ramadan. Surah 49, verse 15 of the Quran, refers to believers, saying, Believers are those who believe in the one, believe in God and his messenger, and doubt not, exemplifying wisdom, but struggle in God's cause with their wealth, exemplifying temperance. 
and with themselves, exemplifying courage in the way of God. They are the just, the truthful ones. Al-Ghazali says in a commentary upon this verse that when it says believers are those who believe in the one God and his messenger and then doubt not, that this is the definition of the virtue called wisdom. We may think that wisdom or a wise person is someone who has several higher degrees in the, uh, or is an attorney or an alim or a scientist. We might define wisdom using these types of persons, but what the Quran tells us is that wisdom is to believe in the one God and his messenger and then doubt not. It may be that the attorney or alim or scientist also believes in the one God and his messenger and doubts not. But the reason why he or she is wise is not because of any worldly success they may have attained, but clearly and simply because they believe in the one God and his messenger and then doubt not. Say, turning point. Who is it that does not have the wisdom? This belief, there are three types of people who would fit the category of not being a believer. The first one would be persons who have too much what we can call worldly wisdom to the extent that they are constantly in doubt about the creation, about the oneness of God, about his messenger. They may be persons who profess or claim to believe in the one God and his messenger, but their belief is with their tongues only. Their hearts are moved in another direction. Their action may appear to be pleasing to the outside world, but inwardly they want power and control. Say, hypocrite. A second type would be those who lack wisdom because they believe in more gods than there are. They are what traditional psychology calls ignorance. Again, in the Islamic view, ignorance is not being illiterate, but ignorance is not to believe in the one God and his messenger. These people are known in the Islamic worldview as those who worship more gods than there are by worshiping their own egos. They do not know that they do not know. Say, aggressor. The third type are those who entirely lack the virtue of wisdom because they do not believe in God and the oneness of God and in his messenger. These people are termed, caught there in our worldview, say, ungrateful. Therefore, wisdom is to believe in the one God and his messenger and then doubt not. This is the first stage that the verse describes. The second is to strive with one's wealth in the way of God. Al-Ghazali describes such a person as having the virtue of temperance or liberality. It is to give of what one has of God's blessings in the way of God. There are many ways of giving, like volunteering our time to educate children, giving some of our wealth to the poor, giving to, of our knowledge of Islam to others. There are all parts of our, these are all parts of our wealth, though which we perform, through which we perform the jihad in God's way. Say, turning point. There are three types of people who do not fit in this category. The first are those who lack a sense of temperance or liberality because they are too much in love with themselves and the external world. They are a, a state, in a state of forgetfulness of who created them and to whom they will return. They show the quality of love of this world to the detriment of the next world living by con with concern over what others might think of them, disregarding their own anti-Islamic criminal behavior, say, honor killings. The second are those who have too much temperance to the extent that they lack any kind of self-esteem. They feel undeserving of whatever blessings God has given them, not because of a sense of humility, but because they honestly feel they do not deserve any happiness or blessings. They show a quality of apathy and depression, say, victim. The third type who are lacking in the quality of temperance are those who are envious of others. 
not only do they not want someone else to have something, they want it for themselves. Say, greedy. The third action mentioned in the Quran in describing believers are those who strive with themselves in the way of God. The quality Al-Ghazali calls courage. It is to be willing to face unpleasant situations, like standing up for the truth, even if it means that they will be rejected by their peers or others around them. Say, turning point. These are three types of, there are three types of people who do not fit the virtue of courage. The first are those who are prone to anger, those who lash out at others or beat others. They are reckless with too much courage. Their extreme state causes them to forget the way of God. Instead, they fight against God. Their struggle is for their own benefit and to the detriment of another person. Say, abuser. The second are those who are too afraid to stand up for the truth. They have too little courage to be able to engage themselves in striving for God's sake. Say, coward. The third are those who lack the virtue of courage, being afraid of everything other than God. They live in a state of fear because they lack the quality of the virtue of courage, say, fearful of other than God. Now the Quran, Quran verse tells us, believers, they are the just ones. Here in Surah 49, verse 15, Al-Ghazali gives us the goal of the believer to show the proof that we believe in the one God and his messenger and doubt not is because we are fair and just, truthful people. When we are fair and just, when we recognize our creator, when we pray to the one God alone, when we show respect for our beloved prophet, his messenger, we are showing proof of our wisdom, moderation and courage through our actions. We do not need to say anything. Whenever we are faced with a situation and we are fair and just, that quality within us is a sign of God's presence. For those who have learned to read the signs, they then know that there is no God but God, and that Muhammad, peace and the blessings of God be upon him, is his messenger. If this refers to turning point, then what about the hypocrite, the aggressor, the ungrateful, the abuser? Are they fair and just? In the Islamic perspective, society is modeled by the prophet who is what is more important Sorry, in Islamic perspective, society as modeled by the prophet is more important than the individual. The opposite of the secular perspective in which we live with in the West. The Islamic ideal is that of Isar, to give to others what we ourselves need. The Messenger Muhammad was the perfect example of this. For on the day of judgment, everybody will say, I, but he will say, my community. When it comes to marriage, in the Islamic view, it, the Islamic view is that marriage acts, ensures healthy preservation of society. Divorce is discouraged, but it is necessary at times, especially to avoid a situation of tyranny. Therefore, we can say that Islam reinforces marriage and discourages divorce. In Surah 2, verse 231, the Quran says that a wife who is being divorced cannot be harmed. Yet the hypocrite, aggressor, ungrateful abuser says, 4, verse 34 says that a wife can be beaten. This means that a Muslim wife who is being divorced cannot be harmed. But a Muslim wife who wants to remain married does so under the threat of being beaten. Does this man-made contradiction support fairness and justice? Does this not badly reflect on the prophet who did not beat anyone, but according to their interpretation, did not carry out God's command to beat either? Which is worse? Could, could they have created yet another man-made contradiction to the outstanding, to the understanding of the Quranic message? This is their view of Islam. But the turning point view is, is contained within the Islamic words of a famous jurist. 
Ibn Qayyim, who said, Islamic law is about achieving people's welfare in this life and the next. It is all about justice, temperance, wisdom, and courage. Thus, any ruling that replaces justice with injustice, mercy with the opposite, common good with mischief, or wisdom with nonsense, is a ruling that does not belong to the Islamic law. So we take this message with us. Believers are those who believe in the one God and his messenger and then doubt not, who strive with their wealth in the way of God, who strive with their lives in the way of God. By helping victims of domestic violence, they are the truthful ones, the fair, the just. And the example that we're going to understand is where we see turning point and the true Islamic view of a wife that in that of Hagar, the wife of Prophet Abraham and founder of the blessed city of Mecca. What does the choice to undertake the way of spiritual warfare mean for her? Hagar, the black Ethiopian slave woman, who some say was a queen taken captive, then becoming a slave. She was a woman who became a monotheist, the mother of the Arab people. Abraham took Hagar to Mecca, where he and his son, whom she bore, Ishmael, were later to rebuild the cabin. Every Muslim who performs the pilgrimage and walks seven times between the hills of Safe and Marwa does so in memory of Hagar. The water of Zamzam, which still flows, is from their time. The water of which the trade was tra she traded for goods to the passing caravans. Then others came to stay as well, building shops and houses. So Hagar was the economic founder of the city in which centuries later our blessed prophet would be born, and near which God was to reveal the Quran to him. God is the best of planners. However, Mecca was not built without sacrifices, the economic and psychological sacrifices of a woman alone with a child. The Kaaba also was not rebuilt by prophets Abraham and Ishmael without sacrifice. Prophet Ishmael grew up without his father, and Prophet Abraham was put through many trials and tests. Once they rebuilt the Kaaba, the tests did not end. Our blessed prophet, Muhammad ibn uh, Abdullah, peace and the mercy of God be upon him, lived through 13 years of sacrifice in Mecca, degradation, humiliation, slander, persecution, and oppression, to be able to establish the companionship of the immigrants and the helpers. Are we ready for this? Are we committed enough to the dream? Will the dream become fuzzy and blurred? Will it fade with time? Will the sacrifice to be too great for us to bear? Outwardly, we can commit ourselves, but it is our inward self that will play havoc with our commitment. It is our egos that will be constantly tested and trying us in this decision. It was her ego that Hagar had to battle with. Let us take her as a model for a few minutes. Hagar as a model of the way where God's, God rewards someone whose society considers in order to try to understand the psychological processes that she went through and see how God rewarded her efforts. Quoting from the book, Hajj Reflections on its Rituals, which describes the Kabe and its relationship to Hagar, we learn Kabe, a cube that is all. Why a cube? Why so simple without distinction or ornament? God is shapeless, colorless, without similarity. Where, where whatever form or condition humanity selects, sees, or imagines is not God. God is absolute, is without direction. It is we who take direction before him. This is why we direct ourselves to the cave, while the cave itself is directionless. How can one direction, how can non-direction be revealed upon the earth? In this way only, all opposing directions be gathered together so that each direction is negated by the opposing side. Then only does the mind understand non-direction. How many directions are there? Six. What form contains these six directions? 
the cube. Its exact secret, the cave. Therefore, wherever you turn, there is the presence of God. Because of this, inside the cave, whatever direction you wish to face for the prescribed prayer, you face him. Outside the cave, whatever way you face, you face him. What other form except the cube faces north, south, east, west, towards the earth and towards the heavens? The cave faces all, faces none, everywhere and nowhere, all six directions, and yet no direction. God. His mystery, the cave. But wonder, to the west of the cave is an addition, changing its shape and giving it a, a direction to it. What is this? A short arched wall facing the cave. What is its name? The hitch of Ishmael. Hitch? What does that mean? Skirt. And it also resembles a skirt, the skirt of a dress, the dress of a woman, yea, an Ethiopian woman, a slave, a black slave, the slave of another woman, a slave so humble that the other woman chose her as her husband's mistress. That is, she was so abased that she could never be considered as being a rival wife. And her husband slept with her for her to bear a child. A woman who in the human system lacked every dignity, every honor, and then God united the mystery of her skirt with the mystery of his existence. This is the skirt of Hagar's dress, the skirt that nourished Ishmael. Here is Hagar's home. Hagar is buried near the third pillar of the cabin. Amazing. No one, not even a prophet, should be buried in the mosque. And here, the house of God, wall to wall with the house of a female slave. And the house of God, the burial place of a mother. What am I saying? God's non-direction is only directed from her skirt. The cafe has extended towards her. There is only a small space between the arch and the house. One can pass through this space without circling the house. But circling the cave, the mystery of tohi, monotheism, without circling around her skirt is not accepted. It is not a hatch. It is a command, a command of God. All of humanity in the always of the ages, all who believe in tohi, monotheism, all who have accepted God's invitation should, in their circumambulation of love around God, around the cave, circumambulate around the skirt of the dress as well. Her house, her grave, her skirt also are part of the circumambulation, are a part annexed to the cave. For the cave, this absolute non-direction is only directed towards this skirt. The cave is directed towards the skirt of an African slave, a good mother, the perpetual place of circumambulation of humanity. The god of monotheism, seated alone upon his om omnipotent throne, rejecting all galaxies behind him, beyond everything that exists. He is alone, and in his heavenly kingdom, unique. But it seems as if from among his creatures, in his infinite creation, he selected one, the noblest of his creatures, the human being, and among all, a woman and among all, a black woman, and among all, a black slave woman, and among all, a black female slave of a woman. The most humiliated of all of his creatures, he has placed her beside himself, a place besides his house, becomes her neighbor, and now, under the roof of this house, one, God, and the other, Hagar. The unknown soldier has been so chosen in the nation of monotheism. All of the hajj is joined to the memory of Hagar and hijrat or migration. The greatest deed, the greatest command is derived from the word of Hagar. And Mohajir, one who migrates, the greatest divine-like human being, a Hagar-like person. And what is migration? It means to go from Kok to Tohi, from ingratitude to belief, 
and the worship of the one God. A Hagar-like movement means the movement of humanity towards civilization. And now, in the movement of humanity around God's house, again, Hagar, O oh, one who migrates, one who has resolved on God. We, our place of circumambulation is the cavity of God and the skirt of Hagar. What do we see? Our understanding contains it not. The sensitivities of a human being in the age of liberty, liberation, and humanism have not the power to bear the meaning. God in the house of a black African female slave. I hope and pray that each and every one of us are able to give generously to support this view of the Muslim woman wife and the work of Turning Point. Bless the Lord.